Then we have the Kia EV6, the Nissan Aria, and we're gonna see how they stack up against the Tesla Model Y. I'm Jimmy. I'm Crystal. And today we have the Kia EV6, the Nissan Aria, and we're gonna see how they stack up against the Tesla Model Y. And the reason we chose the Model Y is because as of now, the Model Y has kind of become the new standard when it comes to EUVs on the market. We're gonna share with you information about their charging time, their range, and some of the unique features. And share with you our interior and exterior impression and overall give you a good idea about how the cargo space is like. So stick around to see how we're gonna do that. Before we move on to anything else, feel free to pause the video here to compare uh, their charging time, also their range. Right off the bat, the first thing I noticed is that the EV6 is an interesting size. Not quite as big compared to the other two, but it's also not small. Generally, I really like the sharp body lines on both the EV6 and the Aria. It looks amazing to me, and especially the head and door handles. I like the overall look as well. It's very sporty and it's very sleek with the body lines. I'm not so much a fan of the hidden door handles. I'm more of a fan of a traditional door handle where I don't need to worry about uh, the handles getting frozen during the winter. Also, uh, the car isn't that high off the ground. Not that it's a big thing, but having more ground clearance will make it a lot easier to get in and out of. And as for the Aria, I love what they did with the front of the vehicle. As you can see right over here, this front piece is not just full black, which means there's a little bit of pattern, which gives the eyes a little bit more to look at actually. Moving on to the Model Y, there's nothing that really sticks out to me too much. It feels a little bit simple, uh, even a little bit plain, but that could also be because there's so many of these on the road. And I would have to agree, although there is nothing out there that looks quite like the Model Y, there's still not much of a wow factor to me. So now we're going to give you our thoughts about the interior space and overall functionality, how we like it. Starting off, we're inside the Model Y. So immediately you can feel how the panoramic roof lets in a lot of light into the cabin, which makes it feel really open and spacious. And you have this one big screen in the middle for all your vehicle controls and info. It does free up the space where your dashboard would normally be, but I just don't know if I'm a huge fan of it. So it actually doesn't bother me too much, but I do get it, you know, having to take your eyes off the road when you're checking like AC, your speedometer, it's not the best practicality wise. But overall, I do think it's something that people can get used to just with a little bit of time. So I don't think it's too big of a deal. Aside from that, there's wireless chargers for two phones, which keeps your phone nice and accessible and also eliminates any charging cable. Also, there's a lot of space in the center console. Overall, the car is very clean and will be a dream car for someone who's a minimalist. Plus, the wood trim here is a nice touch. So because I'm 5'2 and I can fit very comfortably into virtually any car out there, I'm actually going to test Jimmy to review the back for you guys. Yeah, so the back's spacious, good legroom and good headspace, and the moonroof looks even better from sitting back here. This feels a lot smaller after I just set in the Model Y. Uh, even as I'm adjusting my C, the roof still feels quite low. And I do think it's also because the headliner is black too, so it does make it feel a little bit more cramped, but I do also think the black ties in really well with the sporty aesthetic of the EV6. I like the fact that there's a lot of buttons and most of them are capacitive touch. There's this bar here that flips between audio controls and AC controls, which is neat. But when I have my hands on the steering wheel, the knob and some of the buttons here are actually blocked. I just sat in and immediately, like this part of the steering wheel already covers it. Um, I typically like to drive with like hands like kind of down low here, but even without that, just kind of this big centerpiece covers like the knob and kind of some other like controls in the very end here too. But overall, I do have to say, I really like that it has a floating center console because it does open up space like right up over here if you have any like shopping bags or even like work briefcases like such. And you do get a little bit more extra space for storage down here too. The space in the back is okay. Once again, the roof is still quite low. For reference, I'm five foot ten. Uh, I just barely have enough space. For anyone who's taller, this might not be the best fit, but it'll be more than enough for kids. Other than that, the seats are pretty comfortable, pretty soft, and overall very nicely cushioned. 
So overall, I actually really like the design of the Aura's interior. For example, you have the really nice gold copper seam that runs all the way across the dash against the nice faux wood trim. And of course, I have a floating center console as well. So you can actually adjust your armrest position or even free up the space down here so you can put a larger item. And I love the fact that you can actually exit from either side of the doors. The legroom here is really good. I love the sleek uh, touch on the wood dash here. You have these capacitor touch buttons, uh, which is backlit, so it's very nice looking at nighttime. And the steering wheel does not cover anything on this side, which I appreciate. But as I'm playing around with the infotainment system, it does feel a little bit slow and laggy to me, but I would still say it's a great update from what we've seen from the other Nissan lineups so far. Overall, I think it's greatly designed, but one more small nitpick thing is that I'm actually not a big fan of Alcantara inserts, because it can get like a little bit like dusty, or if you have like pets, like, like I have one, and kind of when I'm sitting down, it feels like I'm kind of like scrubbing onto my clothes, you know? But it's not a big deal. Okay, so this might be my imagination, but I'm a little disappointed. The back doesn't feel as big as I imagined it to be. Just looking from the outside and feeling how roomy it is in the front, I think the back feels a little bit small. But it looks like you have a decent amount of like head and leg room though, no? I know, but I just imagine it to be bigger. Oh, okay. Actually, let me come around too. Okay, yeah, okay. So I... No, I get what you mean. I think like looking from outside, it looks bigger, but that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now that we've given you our opinions and share with you our first impressions. On to the segment I'm most excited for. So what we're going to do is take a variety of different size luggages, fit them all into the trunk of each car, see which one can fit most to give you a realistic idea of what you can actually fit with a second row seat still up. Before you guys come at us for forgetting the frunk, we just want to keep it separate because now all EVs are going to have a frunk. Starting off with the EV6, it kind of has one. I liked the fact that Kia tried, but you can see it's not all that big. And the chances are, what if I could fit inside there? I can just bring it inside the car. Not much of a need to put an extra step of popping the hood. As with Aria, it doesn't have a frunk, but in my personal opinion, I feel like it's more so a nice to have, not necessarily a must have. But over here, around to the Model Y, Jimmy mentioned how the EV6 isn't very functional, but the Model Y I think has very good depth, has good whips, so this way, if I, whatever, I need to go on a road trip, I can take whatever I need to put in the back, free up some space, and put it in the front instead. So the Tesla Model Y starts from just under $60,000 all the way up to just under $76,300, depending on the trim. As for the Kia EV6, it starts just above $50,000 and ranges up to right under $80,000. Last but not least, the Nissan Aria starts from just under $56,000 all the way up to just under $73,000. It's cruise control with stop and go. Phone app connection. Leather or leatherette seats. Wireless phone charger. Blind spot intervention. Lane departure intervention. Memory seating. Heated seats. Heated rear seats. Power seat with lumbar. Heated steering wheel. Ventilated front seats. Head up display. But of course, the features can vary depending on the trim that I choose to get into for both the Aria and the EV6, but it's pretty cool to see how many share features they can all have. One thing to keep in mind with the Model Y is that the trims are more so performance and range based, meaning your standard range Model Y would have the same bells and whistles as your performance Model Y. With the exception of that one with the full cell driving option, but even then, that package is about another 20,000 as of now. With the Kia EV6 as well as the Nissan Aria, you actually have the luxury of being able to choose the right trim with the right features suitable for your lifestyle as well as your budget. But to keep the segment short, you can pause to read this chart right beside me in order to see all the other shared features between the Model Y, Aria, and EV6. From the looks of it so far, all three of them are pretty evenly stacked. But when you take into consideration of the different price points, it might make more sense to go for the EV6 or the Aria. 
based on what we've seen and discussed so far. But this is not to say that the Model Y is not a great vehicle because it certainly is. I mean, it's popular for a great reason. I mean, one of, for example, one of the best things that they have that hasn't been seen in other vehicles is their entertainment system. You have access to games as well as streaming services for you want to take a break or when you're out charging. And a cool fact that you may not know is their over-the-air software updates can introduce new features, functionality, and performance. Going beyond map updates, solving minor bug issues, with all of that taken into consideration, I feel that when you're purchasing a Model Y, you're getting more than just a vehicle, but also the ownership experience. All right, so we're starting off with driving the Model Y so we can see how everything really stacks up against it afterwards. So we can give you our impression on this first. So right off the bat, as I was getting like, comfortable in my seats, I really like how you're actually able to not only <laughs> Very bumpy. Um, so, but one thing I do really like is that there's a lot of customization available. Not only are you able to like set up like different driver profiles, which is kind of like your memory like seating system that you're probably more used to seeing. Um, is that I'm actually able to adjust how tight or how loose I want the steering to be. So yeah. So so like Crystal said earlier, it's um, it's very bumpy for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, the car, uh, the Model Y is heavy, right? And they definitely tune it to be more sporty. Right, and you can feel it from the inside. One thing I do notice though, even though we're just doing about 60 kilometers an hour, I do hear a lot of noise from the outside. Uh, yes. Yeah, because you don't get the engine noise, so all you hear is the tire noise. And we'll, we'll see later on when we're on the highway if we get any um, a wind noise as well. Mm -hmm. But overall, very comfortable. I love the seats. I think they do a really good job with these um, uh, the vegan leather. Uh, they feel really uh, soft and um, you almost wouldn't be able to tell if you never sat in a, in, a, in a car with a real leather. We're gonna see how it goes so far. But so far it's really good. I think they did a really good job with their drainage braking. Like it feels like really, really natural. All right, I think I go up here, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it feels really good. But then one thing I did notice maybe I think at lower speeds, the regenerative braking kicks in a lot faster, but I know it's also a mode that you can choose whether you want it to come to a complete stop, creep, or kind of slow down to a roll. Now that we're on the highway, you can definitely tell it's a lot noisier. Noisier, um, yeah. Yeah, these front windows are dual pane, so they're supposed to be thicker, supposed to be quieter, but what I find is they're actually still pretty loud. It's still pretty loud, I would say. I mean, you. I think you can also hear the difference between the pavement. <laughs> and I can hear that you, we almost have to somewhat yell yeah. <laughs> in, inside the car in order to be able to hear each yeah. other. So definitely a difference there. But overall, I think if it feels really solid. I mean, it's a good drive. I mean, I wasn't able to accelerate too much since it was oddly busy for some reason, but it feels really good though. Yeah, but because it's a heavier car, you definitely feel the shift, uh, the the roll of the car more. Okay, so now it's my turn to drive. I'm gonna start off with um, trying to find a parking spot and trying to use the uh, the cameras here and also the sensors. So Tesla does have the ultrasonic sensors, at least on the this particular one. This one is a 2022 mm -hmm. that we are driving. So it didn't have the uh, the sensors delete. And now that we're driving onto the, the city street here, the isolation is definitely good. I mean, we're, not, we're not in just a, a normal setting. We're not in this formal or anything. But the pickup is um, right away. It's kind of why you, mm -hmm. um, why people like uh, EVs. Yeah, so we're excited to see how the rest of the cars will really stack up against it. Because right now the drive is really, really good. And right now, I'm gonna turn on the autopilot. It's super easy, it's a couple clicks, it hooks up right away. And right now we're coming to a curve. It's doing a really good job of following. It's not bouncing off between the lanes. It shows me the speed limit here. The drive itself is really nice. I think, Considering the fact that it's riding on 20 inch wheels, the ride is actually really composed. It's not overly stiff, which is good, but it still grips the road really well. I ran away coming down, coming down to a, uh, a bendy road here. 
and I, I don't even have to take off my, my uh, right foot from the, the electric pedal. Oh, how well is it cruise though, like when you have like no region? So when I have no region at all, it will just keep cruising. Like, you, like going downhill, it's actually still doing some, a little bit of region, but very minimal. Right, but I want to be careful and not to stay here. And if I put on the max region, it's actually charging the battery as we go downhill. Because this uh, this headrest is so wide and so big, I'm actually not able to clearly show the trick behind me very well. It blocks majority of the window that's behind me, so I feel like it's a bit of a safety hazard, but I don't know if Jimmy has the same problem. Um, not so much for me, maybe because I sit a little bit far back, mm -hmm. but I, I get your point. These headrests are definitely very unorthodox in the way that they're designed, like the shape of it. Also, they like stick out forward a little bit more. Uh, but overall, it feels really good and really smooth to drive on. And I actually want to see how well this car cruises with no regeneration on, because I like a car that can cruise well. Is that plus? That was a plus. Let's see. So yeah, now, now it's all the way off. Foot off the gas and just give it a little bit. It's actually really smooth, really, really smooth. Actually, I mean, compared to our experience with the with the Tesla, I mean, for this being able to switch your regeneration mode, I think while you're driving is a huge plus. Because sometimes you don't, maybe you gotta switch between like city driving where you do want more regen, but maybe you want to cruise on the highway. It's good to be able to switch at mid drive versus with the Model Y, you can only do it while you're parked. And another thing I'm kind of noticing is um, the actual steering wheel I mentioned earlier in the video, aside from the sides of it being a little bit clunky, I'm kind of blocking this area down here for like, the volume controls and even like fan casey, fan controls. The side of the steering wheel actually blocks off parts of the dash for me too. So right now I can't really even check my speedometers on the dash, but except I have to look really closely at the head up display. But because it is a brighter time right now, I think brighter time where it's like really shining, it's a little bit hard to see. So maybe it's just my seating position because I generally like having my steering wheel lower if it goes higher. It could work, but it's just not as comfortable for me personally. So now we're on the highway where I set the, uh, the cruise control to 100 kilometers an hour. So this one does have the uh, ACC, which is the intelligent cruise control, and it does have the lane centering assist. Uh, but something unique about Kia, uh, as well as Hyundai, is that they do have on their higher trims the highway driving assist. So this one not only can keep the vehicle uh, in the center of the traveling lane, it can also change the lane uh, on its own as long as you have the hands on the steering wheel. Let's test it out yeah. now. Yeah. So for example if I put on the signal now, my hands on the wheel but I'm not really turning. Oh. The car actually moves on its own and it'll cancel the signal automatically. Alright so now we are in the Aria and we're just pulling onto the highway here and then we'll have Jimmy take over and we'll see how it is. So just gonna do a little acceleration here, merge onto the highway, see how the pickup is. So definitely the power is no issue. I think the Aria's got about 389 horsepower on the Planet model with the dual motor. Does it feel pretty like responsive when you when you tap on it? Yeah, it's it's by no means uh, fast, right? Not, not that it mm -hmm. has to be, but it's definitely capable. Uh, you're overtaking someone, you're you're merging on the highway. It's definitely uh, super easy. And I'm just gonna turn on the Pro Pilot, which is Nissan's um, um, intelligent cruise control with lane centering assist. So a couple clicks, and it's on already. And I, I like the fact that the head-up display is super clear, super crisp, and it's not just black and white. It shows this green uh, lanes and the arrow, and then with the steering wheel, shows me that the system is uh, working right now. So it's actually really, really easy to just uh, hook it up, and it, it's doing a really good job of keeping the car within the lane, which I like. Aside from that, like just we're we're cruising at about 100 kilometers an hour right now. It's actually really quiet. I was just about to mention, I'm yeah. not really getting like too much of road noise like, at all. Yeah. It's like really, really good. 
Like there's not much noise coming from the the wheels, not much from the windows. Overall, very quiet. Yeah, so it's honestly really comfortable. Yeah, the the suspension is not overly bumpy, right? Going over like the uneven uh, surface. One one big difference with the Aria is that the blind spots is much less noticeable. Or worse, in the EV6, I had a really hard time like looking over. So we're, now we're off the highway. We're just doing some uh, city cruising. Um, the good thing is it's just as quiet as it is on the highway for the Aria, which is I really appreciate. Mm -hmm. One thing I don't love uh, particular is how far the brake pedal travels. So right now um, I have the E-step off. Um, and in order to bring the car to a complete stop, I gotta press the the pedal, the brake pedal really deep. And there seems to be a lot of emptiness before the car actually um, uh, comes to a complete stop. Which but is, kind of like when you're pressing the pedal, do you feel it slowing down, or do you feel like there just like there's space where it's not doing anything? Honestly, it's actually, it's the first the I want to say that the first um, quarter of it, there's nothing going on. It's not oh, until I okay. I'm over like around the middle, okay. the middle point, then it starts doing something, right? Interesting, okay. Right, uh, but with the E-step on, you know, it's noticeable, like the car yeah. will, will come to a more gradual deceleration and I can, it's easier for me to control the brakes mm -hmm. and bring it to a smooth stop. But one thing I do want to test out before we go too far is that I noticed when Jimmy was doing his like city driving, um, when he braked, it felt like the car was rolling quite a bit. So I'm gonna try a little bit right now. I'm going about 14 kilometers and I'm gonna brake. Ah, wait, let me go again. Yeah. And I was pretty much going like almost like zero right now. Yeah, so I definitely feel the way shifting yeah. forward and then back, which, you know, um, it's a heavy car, but... Could be, could be made nicer, because yeah. we didn't really feel this in the EV6 or the or the Model Y at all. So I don't know, the rolling thing, I feel like it can be a little bit of inconvenience like when you're parking, where you don't really want to be walking as much. It's like a minor detail, but I feel like throughout, if you're gonna be driving for a long time, you could get used to it, but, or if you're a person that's sensitive to maybe like motion sickness, mm -hmm. it can probably like trigger something if you are driving for like a long period of time. That's true, because yeah. um, all of the EVs are really quiet. Yeah. So, so they definitely gotta feel the, um, the, the motion sickness a lot more for people who, who do feel it. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of feeling what you mentioned about the travel distance for the brakes. Mm -hmm. The Model Y is popular for good reason, although features wise it can feel a little bit lacking considering the fact that it is priced as a luxury vehicle. But the features that only the Model Y has hasn't been really replicated in other cars, so still making it rather unique. Yeah, and I totally agree, but for the average person who is going to be driving this car to get to work and for family use, the games and whatnot are going to be more of a novelty. After driving all three, I feel that the EV6 is more of a solo ride with a passenger on the side type of car, but it could still very well work as a family vehicle, but it's still very compact and might not be for everyone. The Aria is definitely not as sporty as the EV6 or the Model Y, but if what you're looking for is a daily commuter or even the family car mostly driving in the city, this will be a great choice. So ultimately, all three vehicles have their own strengths and appeal, and it's important to consider your own personal needs and budget when choosing the right electric vehicle for you and your family. We hope our insights and comparisons in different areas have helped you in your decision-making process. Remember, the EV market is constantly evolving, so stay informed and explore the different options that best align with your lifestyle. So thank you so much again for joining us as we explore the Kia EV6, the Nissan Aria, as well as the Tesla Model Y. Until next time.